Hello. <laughs> Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> uh, I am Robert Quimby. I am uh, currently at uh, San Diego State University. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about Superluminous Supernova. Uh, I'm going to give you some review over um, uh, of these events and give you some, uh, some of the highlights that have recently popped up. And then at the end, uh, in as much, chair, uh, much time as the chair allows me, I'll tell you some of the new results that we have coming out from uh, the PTF survey. OK, so let's get started. Um, if you go back to the year 2000, um, the most luminous supernova then that had been published was this event 1999CY, which as we now know is actually a type 1A CSM event. Uh, and this reached a peak luminosity uh, of about uh, magnitude minus 20, uh, minus 20, which by modern standards is just adorable. That was, that was fantastic. Um, and that's because in the year 2006, this is 2016, so this is actually the 10 year anniversary of this discovery, uh, we found this, this monster 2006 GY. Uh, and 2006 GY was ju not just more luminous than the previous regular holder, it stayed more luminous for three months. Right? So you integrate this light curve and you get a huge budget of energy there. You get 10 to the 51 uh, ergs of energy just in the photons. All right, so this got a lot of people very excited about this, and there was a lot of uh, work that was done on this. I want to show you uh, a slide from one of the papers by Nathan Smith on this. Um, just to highlight here, uh, this is your, your H alpha feature here in, in your spectra. Um, and black repeated over and over is the 2060Y, and it's being compared to some other events. There is some diversity uh, in these events. They're not all alike, so we were talking about 1As earlier today. Throw that out. This is a zoo now. There's all kinds of different things popping up. Um, uh, one comparison I like is, is this one here, the second one down, comparing 2060Y to uh, 2006TF. Uh, and 2060F to me is more of a standard superluminous type 2 that has hydrogen. Uh, so there's this nice H, uh, alpha and H beta in, in that, uh, but in uh, 2060Y you don't see those features so much. And there's this nice time evolution where the H alpha equivalent lift uh, in increases with time for um, 2060F, but for 2060Y just some, some other random path here. Um, so there's th those, those two types of, hi of high luminosity superluminous uh, supernova 2. There's also another type that uh, does not show these, these narrow features here that you see in here. So there's narrow features uh, that are characteristic for, by definition, this is a type 2N supernova. Uh, some superluminous supernova don't have that narrow feature at all. Uh, so there's at least you know, three different types in this zoo. And of course, there are some superluminous supernova that don't have hydrogen at all. So we, of course, call these type 1s. Uh, this is one of the early examples, 2005 AP, which was uh, even a little bit brighter, uh, more luminous than uh, supernova 2006 GY. Uh, no hydrogen in the spectrum, but it did have these little wiggles here, which we can uh, identify as oxygen 2. So it's got some high uh, ionization features in its spectra. Um, this is a comparison plot we did showing that original discovery, 2005 AP, comparing it to some early discoveries from the Palomar Transient Factory. This is supernova uh, 2010 uh, GX, uh, PTF 09 CND, and down the bottom here, this is SCP 06 F6, and we were able to, to link these together. So there's actually a class of these high luminosity, hydrogen poor supernova. Um, if you go on in time and look how these, these spectra evolve, they actually start looking, well, I, sh I should point out that in early phases, they actually can be compared to a type 1b supernova called 2008d. This is a normal luminosity uh, type 1b. Later times, they can be compared to some uh, type normal luminosity type 1c supernova, and the spectra show some similarities uh, to these. Uh, there's some preference uh, shown in this paper to, to the broadline uh, type 1c's in particular at late times, although I'll, I'll comment on that later. Um, Assuming we have time. Um, so, so there is this kind of progression uh, later in time where they, they, they start looking more like the, the normal luminosity supernova. Um, one thing I do want to point out, this, this is a, kind of a fair way to compare them. So, well, no, nothing's really fair in life, but th this, is, this is as fair as we're going to get. Uh, here, so let's start with this green line here. Here's your, your spectrum of a type 1A supernova. Uh, we have wavelength uh, and uh, lum luminosity here on a log-log scale. Uh, here's a type 2 supernova. And you can see there's these nice standard features. There's your 6150, there's your H alpha feature. And here are the features in the superluminous supernova. And the, the key thing I want to get for, this, for later in this talk is that these features are very, very subtle. It's not like these type 1As where you get these, you know, you're losing 50% of your flux there and then the bottom of that line. These, these are, you know, 15%, uh, maybe a little bit more in the UV here. 
Um, very subtle. And of course, the other obvious thing on this plot is if you normalize them, these are all spectra taken near optical maximum light. And if you look at the, the relative uh, luminosity distributions at, at optical maximum, and you look in the UV, you see these superluminous supernova are hundreds or thousands of times more luminous than normal supernova. Uh, and that's another reason to be excited about these, because we can actually detect these today uh, out to redshift four pretty easily. And I don't know where Masomi Tanaka is, but this is actually going on. So this is something that, that we should uh, expect to start seeing these discoveries coming in, right? <laughs> he nodded, so it's, it's, it's a sure thing. Um, but the, the, the key thing in all this is, is key differences. Basically, these spectra, they show high ionization features and they have much more flux in the blue, so they, they, they look hot. And you can kind of quantify this by doing some simple black body fitting. You can fit the, the spectra and the, the photometry to a, to a black body model, and you can get temperature and radius over time. And then you can compare that to, to normal luminosity supernova. Like here's that 2008D again, that normal velocity uh, 1B. Uh, and of course, normal supernova, uh, they start out very hot and then they expand quasi adiabatically and they cool down. So very, qu very quickly, you go from something that's very hot and it cools down, and, and, and there you go. Uh, for these superluminous supernova, the key factor in these is that they manage to stay hot for a very long time, for, for months. They manage to stay very hot. So the models that exist um, to explain these events have to explain that. How do you keep this supernova hot, even though it's expanding very fast, just like other supernova? Uh, it's expanding, but it's staying hot. So how do you do that? I'm just going to quickly go through um, some of these ideas. Um, they're going to be talked about a little bit more later in the session, hopefully in more detail than I'll go into them. Um, but one of the most interesting ideas that first came up was this idea of the, the pair instability supernova. Um, so just the key takeaway you need from this is that it is theoretically possible to have a star where you um, basically burn uh, the whole core. Uh, so you could have a, a thermonuclear runaway in the core of a star, and it could be a very, very massive uh, star, so you could potentially make a lot of radioactive material. That radioactive material then can supply your heat uh, to, keep this, to keep the supernova hot over time. Uh, so this is something that um, has been used to explain uh, some of these uh, superluminous supernova. One of the, the best examples of this is probably 2007 BI. Uh, Avshay Galyam has some papers on this showing that if you look at the, the light curve at uh, going out to, to fairly light times, it declines about one magnitude every 100 days, which is actually what you would expect from the decay of uh, cobalt-56. Uh, so this is you know, roughly consistent with this idea that you produced a lot of nickel-56 in the explosion. Uh, there's also perhaps some uh, uh, evidence for uh, excess iron lines in the spectra. So this is, again, also consistent with this idea of overproduction of nickel-56. Um, not everybody believes this. I'll just put that right out there. Um, uh, some of the, the criticisms are actually, uh, there's two main criticisms. One is that the, the spectra that, that uh, modelers predict, and this was shown, I think, originally by uh, Luc Desart in uh, 2012, but there's been some more recent work also uh, um, showing this again, uh, the, the spectra tend not to look like this for, for the models. The models tend to be much more red uh, than the spectra are. The, the spectra that we observe are actually pretty blue. Uh, another thing is, is the rise time. So uh, for 2007 BI, it wasn't actually very well constrained, but uh, with some possibly similar events that show fairly rapid uh, rise time, rapid meaning 50 days as opposed to 100 days. Uh, and that's not um, what these models at least are predicting. Uh, I do want to actually highlight, though, now, there's this work that uh, Ragan Hill Lunan is, is putting out. Uh, she just told me this was posted, so you can see this very soon on the archive. Uh, and this is of this PanSARS event, PS114BJ. That shows, if you look at the scale here, about 125 day rise. And then after peak, it declines at about one magnitude every 100 days. So this is actually very consistent with what you would see for these models shown here uh, for parent stability supernova. Although I think in her paper, which I haven't had time to read yet, uh, I believe uh, she shows that the, the spectra again have this problem, that they're too blue. They, they don't match the models. But there's some very clever people in this room, some very clever theorists, and I believe if you really put your mind to it, you can find a way to make those models blue. <laughs> okay. But this model is not going to explain all these superluminous supernova. There are superluminous supernova, such as 2006 UI and 2010 GX, that are shown to de decline basically too fast. Uh, at late times, they are too faint 
to explain the peaks, at least, with uh, a sufficient production of nickel-56, right? Uh, so not all of these are, are, are um, um, parent stability supernova, so there's something else must be at least powering this peak up here. Uh, the next um, most obvious thing for, for powering that peak is actually an interaction. So we actually, we know that this is taking place in, in at least these supernova where we see these narrow lines. Uh, a narrow line means you have slow moving gas and when you have the supernova ejecta that just runs that down, eventually it interacts and doesn't, that interaction produces um, another, effectively a, a, a source of heat that keeps it hot, right? So you, you stay hot um, longer and thus brighter longer. Um, so, so this, this is at play, it's just a question of how significant this is in, in the grand scheme of things. And there, there has been some, um, uh, some concerns about this because there is this, this problem that you, you need not just a little, not just a simple wind blowing off these, but you actually need a, a large, a very huge amount of mass loss uh, pouring off the star right before it explodes. And some people, uh, uh, when this idea first came out, uh, kind of opposed to that, but I think Nathan Smith has, has done uh, a good job and uh, shown a lot of work that maybe this is, is something that we should expect from massive stars. So just to, to quickly remind you, uh, in those last few years of a, of a star's life, there, there's a lot going on there. And especially there's this oxygen burning phase when there could be some uh, instabilities that uh, pop, uh, pop up and could potentially lead to some eruptions right before it actually does finally explode. Uh, one of these favorite models of mine, personal favorite, is this pulsational pair instability model. Um, here's a, a slide that Stan Woosley et al. put out uh, in 2007. This was originally put together to explain supernova 2006GY. Uh, and the idea behind a pulsational pair instability is that you have a pulsation that throws off a shell of material, star settles back down, and then there's another pulsation that runs off, and then those two expelled shells collide, and you get something that looks a lot like a supernova which is all well and good, but I'm actually a little bit more interested myself in what happens actually after this red line here. Because you still have those shells of material, and then there's a supernova that happens inside of that. So I'm kind of curious what would happen in here, and, and I got to thinking about this and actually looking at the, this table of possibilities. Um, it, it looked like there was these some cases where you know, the first eruption knocks off this hydrogen shell and it goes flying off. You have a second shell of hydrogen poor material. Then you have a supernova inside of that. So maybe there's an interaction that helps power even these, these um, hydrogen poor ones where you wouldn't see narrow lines because the shell is moving fast. And then th there's a prediction of this, which is that at late times, you might actually run into that hydrogen shell. So we started looking at, at uh, supernova and if you look at enough supernova, you find it. <laughs> uh, we found this event here, which uh, Lin Yan uh, published last year. It's PTF 13 EHE. Early times looks like something a lot like 2007 BI, um, hydrogen poor superluminous supernova. But then if you look at somewhere around a year after explosion, suddenly, boom, H alpha pops up. So we do have this looks, what looks like a shell of, hyd of hydrogen that was detached from the supernova in the years right before it exploded. So I think this is a very interesting result. Um, so I'm personally very fond of this, this uh, type of model, but uh, I would not say that the, the community at large generally agrees with this model. I think that the favorite model by far is this idea of, of some kind of central engine, in particular a magnetar model. So in this scenario, um, when you have your core collapse supernova, you know, you have a fairly normal super, uh, core collapse supernova, you form some compact object, and there's a lot of energy uh, pot potentially associated with this compact object. If you can get some of that energy, tap into it, and the tooth fairy comes and puts it into the ejecta, right? Then you could potentially keep this nice and, and hot and, and have uh, something that looks like a superluminous supernova. Uh, so there's some models by Stan Woosey and Dan Kaysen and, and Lars Bildston, uh, which show that this actually does a pretty good job of fitting some of these superluminous supernova. There's also some uh, um, predictions uh, that this model makes um, in terms of, of X-rays. So Brian Metzger showed that uh, there could be something analogous to a pulsar wind nebula that forms uh, in one of these. And eventually, as the supernova ejecta expand, the X-rays could break out from that and you can have an X-ray flare. Uh, and I think this is motivated, it's not really a prediction, it's kind of a post-diction, because it was, it was um, made in response to the uh, SCP-06-F6 event, which potentially had an X-ray source at 10 to the 45 ergs per second, right? Which is a lot. 
Um, but there it is, and it, it uh, faded pretty quickly over time. So I, I actually don't know if I 100% believe this. There's some uh, interesting stuff going on with the observations, but it is something that we can test. Uh, so we've gone out uh, and taken uh, SWIFT data on a number of uh, superluminous supernova, and uh, so far I haven't seen anything that looks like SCP-06-F6. Uh, there's, uh, this is my student, by the way, this is uh, one of my students, this is Melanie Oles, uh, who, as you can see from the cap and gown, just graduated uh, on, uh, on Saturday. She was an undergraduate in our program. She's actually going to stay on at San Diego State and join our master's program, so she'll be around for another couple years, um, with me at least. Um, and so this is her analysis. She's looked at the, these data from, this is, this is that Assassin 15LH, which is the, kind of claimed to be the most luminous uh, type one, although I think that's debatable. Um, if I have time at the end, I can talk about that a little bit more. Um, no detections, these are all upper limits. What is potentially the most interesting one she's looked at so far is this event, uh, CCS 141223, which magically, even though it was discovered in 2014, has the IU name 2015BN. Um, mostly um, limits, but there is this one blue line here, which is a possible detection. I show here, this is the image, the x-ray image, and you want to count together, there's one, two, three, four, five photons uh, in this little aperture, um, which is not stunning, but if you look at the background, what's the expected number in a circle that size is actually zero. So that's possibly a five sigma detection. That's what Bayes says. Don't, don't, don't laugh at me. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm not super confident in this. I'll, I'll say that. It may not be astrophysical. That's, that's something to worry about. OK. Um, moving on. Uh, there's some more predictions that you could, or, or again, post predictions that you can get from this uh, uh, double peak, uh, from this uh, Magasar model. Um, there is this, uh, this uh, double-peaked uh, light curve uh, behavior that we see in some events. So this is a paper from uh, Matt Nichols showing you have this uh, initial little rise, and then it goes up to the main peak. And it was shown in, in Nickel and Smart that this is actually a common feature of subluminous supernova type 1. Um, and uh, Dan Kaysen et al. showed that you can exp uh, explain this with the magnetar model if you have, uh, you basically can get something analogous to a shock breakout uh, going on. So that could explain this. Um, so one of the nice things in the Magnetar model is it, it does explain these kind of nice smooth light curves that you get um, uh, from supernova, from superluminous supernova, and it's been argued that's, that's a sign where you don't have interaction. So let me show you some superluminous supernova now that have bumps in their light curves. Uh, here's one that's coming out of the paper by Paul Wieswick. Uh, this is PTF 13 DCC. Uh, so we do have something, kind of a bump uh, in the light curve. Um, that is very difficult to explain with the Magnetar model, at least the, the kind of the simple model. Um, this is Monos Kachopoulos' uh, model being applied here. Um, uh, it does work a little bit better with uh, uh, CSM interaction model. And if, if one bump isn't enough for you, we have some more. Here's one, two, maybe three bumps. Um, so we have some, this is a paper Lynn Yan and all is, is uh, working on. Uh, so we do have some interesting things, I think, uh, popping up in terms of these bumps and wiggles in the light curves of these type 1 superlum supernova. Uh, I'm gonna, I think it's scaled. <laughs> Somebody doesn't like the units here. It's a <laughs> um, okay, so when do we start? How am I doing on time? Yeah. Six minutes? All right, I'm going to skip some slides. Um, let me go right to this. Um, I started looking at the spectra of superluminous supernova and trying to ask the question, if, um, is there a spectroscopic difference between the higher luminosity ones and the lower luminosity ones? And the short answer is yes. If you give me a spectrum, I can say that that is a high luminosity uh, event or a low luminosity event. Uh, so we can use this, we can take this, this method, and we can actually apply it to all the data set that we have at PTF. We have uh, thousands of supernova, we can go through all of them, and we can pick out the ones spectroscopically that are type 1 superluminous supernova. So for the rest of the talk, I'm not going to mention anything about uh, the type 2s, it's going to be on the type 1s. Um, so, so that's our sample. So we have a sample now of spectroscopically selected uh, type 1 superluminous supernova. There's a paper that's already out on the archive by Dan Perley looking at host galaxies. We'll, we'll hear a little bit more about host galaxies in the next talk. Um, there's a paper in the works by uh, Annalisa DeSia uh, who's looking at the photometry of the sample. So you can actually now make a proper um, peak magnitude distribution for these events since you're not using magnitude as a definition to select them. 
So that's shown here with these, these blue um, symbols here. So this is the histogram of the observed sample. Uh, and this is compared to the, from, uh, the sample of PTF uh, type 1Cs and broadline type 1Cs. And so I think putting this together with the spectroscopic selection, you can at least make the case that, again, um, there, there's, there is a distinction uh, in luminosity in the spectra. The spectra do hint at what the luminosity of the object is. So I think it's the simplest uh, explanation for what we're seeing here. Um, one other point from uh, her paper that's very preliminary but interesting to point out, there is a, um, a, a favoritism going on for this ma uh, late time decay of one magnitude every 100 days. Um, we can do some analytics uh, for the, um, uh, do some analysis uh, uh, in detail of, of the, the spectra that we get. And one of the first things you want to do is actually look at the, the velocities of these lines so you can get some idea of, of how fast the eject is moving. Uh, this has been done before. There's a, a paper by uh, Inseridol showing that if you look at, you know, kind of over two months past maximum light, that the velocities de decline uh, by, you know, several thousand kilometers per second. And there's also a paper um, by uh, Nicol et al. showing that if you look from maximum life for a couple months, the velocities are flat um, for a few months. So uh, there's some contradictions going on here. And I, I took a little bit of, uh, uh, took a deep look into this. And it, it's tricky because we have those, those weak features and there's a lot of blends and there's a lot of crazy things going on. So really we, the best shot we have is using the, this oxygen two lines. Um, they're the strongest features in the optical. Um, they are not great because these, these features I've labeled here, A, B, C, D, E, are, are not from single lines. They're actually from multiplets and sometimes multiple multiplets. Uh, so there is a lot of blending going on here, but uh, you know, this is the best thing we have and I, I think it's actually uh, pretty good for what we need to do. Uh, so actually this line here, B in particular, I think is very useful because it's made of two multiplets um, that are separated a little bit. And if you look at some of these superluminous supernova, in particular here's 12 DAM, you can actually resolve those two features. So you can fit a model where you're basically, you're taking all those lines and you're systematically shifting them to some uh, velocity and then you just blur them out with the Gaussian and then you fit it to your data. And then you can get what I believe is a pretty accurate measurement of the velocity of that line. So there we have a measurement of oxygen two. You can do this over time. Um, but another thing you can actually do, and something I'm leaning towards at this point, is actually taking that, that first spectrum where we've measured the velocity and then cross-correlating it uh, just in this wavelength range with the, the, the future spectra and then just getting the relative shift over time. And then you can plot that and this is what I get. So for oxygen two, we started about 11,000 kilometers per second and it declines uh, over, over a period of about 30 days from, this is a, uh, kind of 25 days before maximum light, so you know, around five, 10 days after maximum light, uh, it declines by about 4,000 kilometers per second. So this is really the, the, the first velocity curve that I think is, is really pretty solid uh, measurement. This is for a 12 DAM. So then we can turn now and look at uh, iron. Uh, and iron is tough. This has been used before, and I, I think this is nicely summarized in this uh, slide from uh, this figure from Matt Nickel that it's, it's kind of a mess. Um, it's very difficult to, to figure out where uh, iron actually is in some of these spectra. Uh, in PTF 12 D, um, DAM, there is this one spectrum of maximum light where I think I can see the three uh, components of this, this iron two triplet. Uh, so I, I take that as my reference, I fit velocities for this, and I cross correlate to everything else. It's a bit of a mess, but if you put that on the same plot as oxygen two, here's what you get, right? So we have velocity uh, evolution for iron two and for oxygen two. And when the, the, the key result of this is that you can see the iron two is actually several thousand kilometers per second faster than oxygen two. And I think this, this makes sense. Oxygen two is an, a high ionization line. You have to be very hot to, to, to make this. It's probably very close to the photosphere. Iron two is not, you can be much cooler, so it's probably much higher up in the photosphere. So that, that could explain this. So I think oxygen two is, is pro probably tracing the photosphere pretty well, maybe iron two is not. And I, I probably won't have much time to say it, but also there's a similar problem with magnesium two. All right, if you do have oxygen two, then there's a good, um, if, if you have oxygen two, then if you have helium present, you should have helium lines in the spectra because it's, it's hot enough or there's enough ionization to, to ionize helium. 
Um, so let's see if there's any helium in these superluminous supernova. So for reference, here's this red spectrum here. This is 2005 BF, and I'm showing the, the vertical lines here, the, the, the lines of you'd expect for helium-1. And you can see uh, there they are in the 2005 BF. If you go to 12, PTF 12 DAM, you can see right where this uh, 5800 line is supposed to be, there's nothing. Uh, maybe at later times, not so much, maybe a bit. If you really believe, then maybe you can make that into uh, helium-2. But there's not obvious signs of, of helium. Uh, in 12 dm. However, we do have one event that really sticks out. This is PTF uh, 10 HGI. And in this case, I would say we actually do have pretty obvious lines, uh, significant lines at least, of uh, helium-1. So this event really does stand out from the other superluminous supernova I've looked at. It does seem to show helium. There's possibly also a high velocity uh, uh, H-alpha feature there. Uh, so since, since my time is up, I'll have to kind of skip over this. Um, there's more lines, plenty more in the UV. It's a great place to look for lines. Um, there is some uncertainty, I think, in my mind right now exactly what these lines are. Uh, different groups have put out slightly different uh, identifications for these features. Um, we have some nice uh, data to look at now. This is actually data for uh, 12 DAM again. This is data that was taken by HST, the UV GRISM. Uh, and these are very nice. These are not smooth. Those are the actual data. Uh, we have very nice features. You can actually see um, some of these lines resolve. So here's that magnesium line. And there is a, a little carbon feature there. It kind of kinks the side here. And there's also another feature here, which I haven't seen a good identification for yet. So there's at least three features in this blend here. And you can uh, kind of see some time evolution here, some interesting things going on. Um, but I guess the one last point I want to make is that um, we don't really know what these lines are. There's, there's still kind of a question about what, what the identifications are. And if I just take um, the published uh, IDs and I take uh, Sino and I, I fit those lines, I can actually get pretty good fits and I can fit the oxygen. But then there's this prediction for what you should see in the far UV and it's kind of a mess. And it doesn't necessarily agree so well with the data. Um, that could be for different reasons. Uh, there's only really one event we have that covers this region. This is this PANSTARS event, PS111 BAM. That's the only one that actually goes into the far UV. I'm excluding Assassin here um, for good reason. Um, I'm, I'm, this is the only one that goes in the, in the far UV. So we really could use some more data in this region to help with these line identifications uh, because when you make a line over here, you predict a line in the far UV, and it would be good to test that. And the other reason why we want those other lines is because there are these surveys that are starting up right now, like with Subaru, that are, gonna be, that are starting to find these things at redshift four. And if you have a supernova that you discover in the optical redshift four and you get a spectrum of it, you're looking in the far UV. So it's time we had a comparison sample um, for those events. And I'm way over time, right? Me. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll, I'll stop there, thanks. So what's your beef with uh, Assassin 15LH? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if it's a superluminous supernova. And I think actually this slide is probably um, the best um, representation of that. This is a spectrum that is, is now out in uh, Peter Brown's uh, paper. This is a UV spectrum uh, taken with HST, of course. Uh, and if you look in this UV region where we get all these nice broad features and all these superluminous supernova, there's, there's really nothing there. So what I can say is, if it's a superluminous supernova, it looks nothing like any of the other ones that we found so far. So uh, you mean it's not for that particular class? Well, I guess, what do you mean by superluminous supernova? Do you mean? I mean, the claim is that it is a type one superluminous supernova similar to 2010 GX. But those are just, those are observational classifications. Yes. I'm saying that uh, magnet, uh, the luminosity cut and the lack of hydrogen and the lack of helium. Yeah. So then, based on just that, you don't think it's you don't think it fits that classification, or you don't think it's like the others? It's like nothing I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> How do you answer it? It's PTF in the Robert, it, it, it's a special event. I mean, don't, it's very interesting. I, I just don't think we we've had the the last word on it yet. I think there's some more some more surprises in it. Can you comment on? Um, yeah. Ah, there you go. Uh, the paper Mazali et al. this year that su suggests that the O2 lines are non-thermal excitation. So how does that jive with your idea that oxygen would slow down faster than iron? Uh, so 
Yes, Mazzali had this, this paper out. Um, these are a couple figures from that, that paper uh, suggesting that these O2 lines are non-thermally excited. Uh, maybe they're not, but I, I don't think that's necessary to say. So the, the continuum is, is very hot. Right? And we have these measurements. The, the, the temperature is 15,000 Kelvin. And that's the temperature where you can ionize he, uh, oxygen. So I, I don't have anything that's as quantitative what he, what he does. So I can't say if, if there's uh, enough ionized oxygen to uh, match the depths of these features here. But it is in a regime where you know, it is hot enough to make this line. Um, and we don't see other lines. So this, this is one of the arguments for, for helium, is that you, know, you see uh, helium in some uh, regular normal luminosity supernova, but then you see these other features uh, that are more characteristic of the lower temperatures. So the non-thermal excitation is, is important for having both of those at the same time. But here we don't have those, we don't have calcium. You know, calcium is not present, for example. So I don't know if it's actually needed. I think maybe just temperature alone can explain it. 